Hey, everybody. Welcome to Integrate Yourself. I'm your host, Allison Polo, and you can find me at pureenergypdx.com. I'm a holistic fitness and nutrition coach, and I help my clients build a solid movement and nutrition practice that they can always rely on to keep them healthy, feeling good, feeling confident and strong. And best of all, create a body that they love being in. Because who doesn't want to find joy in the body that they're living in? So if you'd like to learn more about the programs I offer, which are both either online or in person, you can head over to pureenergypdx.com and you can set up a free 30-minute coaching call with me and we can talk about your needs, your wants, and how I can help you. Today's guest is Eugene Trufkin of TrufkinAthletics.com. Eugene was born and raised on an off-grid biodynamic farm in Ukraine and is the author of Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide. He graduated from the University of California, Irvine, and is a Czech-trained professional. He currently operates through TrufkinAthletics.com. Eugene uh, was a great guest. He was amazing, and he was just the person I was looking for to provide people with a, an amazing resource. And really, um, I, I've been looking for this for a while because, uh, as we talk about in this episode, uh, the food industry has made it super compli- complicated to figure out how you can find uh, really high quality food, and. So with that, there's many, many labels, and even I was getting a little confused uh, about how to figure this whole thing out because much has changed over the last five years. And so uh, this book is so great because, uh, first of all, it's a very small book. It's an easy read. It's small enough to fit into your shopping bag. Uh, You can take it to the grocery store with you. Quickly just reference what you're needing to find. And and, uh, for example, if you're looking for chicken, you can just go to the chicken section. And he gives a, a really brief also description of what logos to look for and what labeling to look for to look for the highest quality product, which is amazing that you can find it that quickly. Plus, um, he talks about water quality in his book, which I think is so great uh, because I feel like a lot of people really probably don't know uh, the difference in water quality and especially the water they buy, as well as genetically modified food. And he talks about that in his book and supplements, the right supplements to buy that are high quality. And really the overarching idea from today's show or what we want you to take away is um, really to start to begin to think think about peeling away the layers of toxins that you take into your body on a daily basis and really changing your food quality can be a first step towards that. Um, In the short term, we don't think that that really makes a difference, but it really does over the long term as we talk about in today's show. Um, especially when it comes to your immunity, which I know everybody is thinking about right now with the coronavirus scare. Um, But really what your best line of defense is, is to change your food quality. And to also, so good nutrition and good sanitation are really your two top uh, lines of defense for your your body's natural immunity to kick in. We talked about this on the show I did with Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, and she described really very well how your body's natural immunity works compared to your immunity when you get a vaccine. And so the natural immunity will adapt to whatever comes in into your uh, body or what is coming from the outside in. So with that, the less toxins that you have that your body has to work through the better your innate immunity is going to be able to switch on for those kinds of things. So what uh, Eugene's book does is it really gives everyone a great resource um, in how to find the highest quality food with the least amount of toxins. And that's really what we want to be doing over the long term. I'm not asking anybody to be perfect with, with their eating, just to become aware of, you know, what you're doing 90% of the time, right? And that's what's going to add up over the years. Um, and so, 
This is what I encourage everybody to start thinking about. And he makes it really easy and simple and very accessible in his book. And that's what I love about it. And this book will become one of uh, my new resources for all my clients that go through my coaching program. And so I hope you pick up a copy too. One more thing I wanted to add about what I loved about his book, which he has some great illustrations, which really just stick in your mind about what uh, the state of the farm looks like that you're buying uh, the product from. So, for example, um, what cage-free eggs look look like, what that environment looks like with the chickens. He gives you a really clear picture that is just, it's it's really genius because it sticks with you and you remember that image. And so then when you see the label, you're going to that image will come up for you and you'll say, oh, that's what that looks like. So uh, really well done. And I cannot recommend his book more. So definitely uh, go check it out. I will leave a link as well on the show notes so that you can access it too. So before we start the show, I wanted to honor uh, one of my biggest supporters, both on the show and in life, uh, my dad, Jim Draper. He passed away just recently, uh, February 22nd, 2020. Uh, I was there with him. Uh, Gratefully, I was there with him when he passed away. And, um, you know, but it was a little bit of a shock because we weren't expecting it. And so when, whenever that happens, um, and he was doing really well, and so that's why it was a shock. But, um, you know, whenever that happens, you when you lose a parent unexpectedly or, or expectedly, it's still always a bit of a shock and um, a, a huge loss. So um, I wanted to dedicate today's show to my dad because without my dad, I wouldn't have the values I have today and I wouldn't be able to uh, teach the people I'm teach you guys what I teach, you know, like I wouldn't have these values of health and wellness and well-being and self-care, which is really what I I saw from my dad's example as I grew up. So, um, so thanks, dad. I love you and I'll miss you. Today, I'm here with Eugene Trufkin. He is the author of the Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide, which I consider a really amazing resource for everybody in this day and time, especially for people who have the right intention of wanting to shop organic and wanting to shop healthy and you're going into into the store with with that intention of really getting the highest quality food. But now in this day and age, it's so confusing because of all the marketing and now um, the terminology has changed quite a lot. Um, And so that's why I brought Eugene on the show today to give us some more uh, education in that area and some more understanding about what all of these terms mean on a deeper level. Um, And because he has has had this experience of going out to these farms and he can get a little more into his background and and finding out um, all of this information that he put it together for his book. Uh, But yeah, thank you, Eugene, for coming on. And I really am so happy you're here. Yeah, thanks for having me as a guest, Allison. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, no problem. I I am just um, so glad that somebody finally came out with this kind of information. Because um, even like the the past, like I started at the Czech Institute, and I know that you have been certified at the Czech Institute as well. I think you had HLC level one and two. Mm -hmm. And you know, we learn all about organic food and and even much deeper than that, actually, at the Czech Institute. But I I started this back in 2006. And so much has changed since then, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell my clients just go go buy organic and I could actually, um, you know, get into the specifics of, um, you know, there wasn't that many variations on what all these terms meant back then. But now it's changed quite a bit. And so, Yeah. So I would love to first, I just want you to, you know, tell everybody a little bit more about you and kind of what led you to this uh, point in your life, writing this book and and how you really got this information to write the book um, and what inspired you to do so as well. Uh, Yeah. I mean, just like yourself, I've been kind of like passionate, enthusiastic about health and wellness for the longest time. 
And um, basically, like, I just always bought food at the supermarket, usually kind of like the cheapest food like you can find at Costco, for instance, because in my mind's eye, like I would look at the produce and it all looked the same. So I didn't think there was like a quality difference whatsoever between kind of like the the more expensive, like, uh, for instance, certified organic stuff at the store or like just the normal like factory farm, conventionally farm produce, because visually it kind of looks all the same. So I'm like, oh, it must be all the same. And I did that for for many years. But then kind of like I think like three or four years ago, I ran into uh, a video on YouTube called Nutrition, the Dirt Facts. And it was hosted by Paul Check. Obviously, you know who that is. And that video kind of opened up my eyes to the uh, like factory farm productions and the agricultural production system in the U.S. And it kind of made me really realize that there is a quality difference in the way that uh, for example, that we produced food on that off-grid biodynamic farm in Ukraine that I grew up on and the way food is produced currently in the U.S., even like the USDA certified food that you'll find at the supermarket. So to give you like an example of how confusing it's become, let's say you're kind of uh, you're a person that's seeking out to improve your health. You want to kind of like maximize your your wellness and you hire a dietitian to basically kind of like give you advice on the nutrition portion of your journey. And the dietitian tells you, oh, make sure like out of a myriad of things, she tells you to make sure you buy free range organic eggs, which is like good advice on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. And 99% of people will just go to the supermarket because rarely do people kind of source their nutrition from a small farmer at first. So most people start at the supermarket and they probably stay at the supermarket level for the for the rest of their life. And so that person will take that advice. Uh, the nutritionist said, I have to buy free range organic uh, eggs and they'll go they'll go to the supermarket and they'll see that they'll see that on the label. But let's go ahead and break down. These days, like what free range organic really means in terms of egg production, and then we'll kind of get into other food groups as the podcast continues. But basically today, free range, even if it says USDA organic, is pretty much kind of like a factory farm system. What you're going to see in that kind of operation is basically like a huge shed with maybe like 50,000 hens or sometimes even more, maybe like 60, 70 to 100,000 hens. And they get basically like a very small concrete patio where they get to roam outside. Uh, for like X amount of hours per day. Also, the entrance to these small little concrete patios are just like basically very, very small doors. Usually the kind of production, uh, usually, especially for broiler chickens, usually the production cycle is like somewhere between 12, 12 weeks. It takes from hatching the bird to actually slaughter about 12 weeks to grow them to full size. And they're too young to even kind of like realize there's that small limited concrete patio to even roam outside in. So basically, like if you do end up going to any of these operations, what you'll end up seeing is usually like 99% of these hens are just constantly inside. And then maybe you'll see like a, a handful of them walking around outside at that concrete patio. That's mm. in terms of their living conditions. But that's not the most important thing to consider because... You know, some people, they're like, okay, well, I don't care about, you know, the ethics of or the husbandry practices of how these hens are raised. I just care, care about, like, the nutritional profile of the egg because I want to optimize my own health, which is kind of fair enough to say. But the problem with that system is when you have, like, that large amount of chickens, uh, hens, egg-producing hens that are stuck in a single facility – and you don't rotate them onto fresh pasture daily, which is kind of like what's required. Usually if a person has never um, basically raised any hens themselves, they'll know that all hens do is basically just like eat all day. They wake up at a predetermined time, they eat all day, and then they kind of go to sleep. In a sense, they're like the perfect worker. You know, they don't go out, they don't mm -hmm. party. They just kind of like work all day, they eat, and then they just go to right. sleep. We used to have backyard chickens. <laughs> Yeah, and the problem yeah. with that system is when you can't take the hens to the food, you have to bring the food to the hens. Mm -hmm. And usually what ends up happening is the farmers just feed these hens nothing but grains. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times what you'll see in small subtitles 
on the packaging on the free range uh, on the free range packaging is you'll see usually free range at the top and then kind of like at the bottom in small print you'll see vegetarian fed mm. and this is actually not a good thing to see on the packaging so what what vegetarian fed means is basically they're grain fed and the problem with that is chickens for example are omnivores they eat bugs insects other vegetation they kind of peck on the ground for minerals as well and what happens when you don't feed them a species specific diet you mainly feed them nothing but grains which is what that vegetarian fed label means is basically it shoots up the omega-6 way up in in the actual nutritional profile of the egg in this case and omega-6 is basically a pro-inflammatory micronutrient mm -hmm. and if a person looks up for example the inflammation theory of disease they'll see that the bulk majority of disease does arise probably 90 percent plus of the disease does arise from chronic low-grade inflammation so once again this person went to the nutritionist the nutritionist told them to buy free range organic chicken eggs that person went to the store to purchase those eggs in hope of kind of optimizing their health but in reality all it's really doing is just increasing the inflammation in that person's body where for example like um joel at one i think this was done in like 2007 mm -hmm. and uh joel salatin and i think like 13 or 14 other like legit pasture raised operations went and got their eggs tested mm -hmm. uh, in like some certified lab in Portland, Oregon. I forgot exactly the name of it. It's been a little while since I read the study, but basically it showed that it had 300% more omega-3 as compared to hens that are fed nothing but grains. Wow. And also 700% yeah. more beta carotene, like 200% more vitamin A and 300% more of like some other vitamins. I honestly forgot, but I'm pretty sure the person could easily Google this study and find it online. Right. So on top of that, pro-inflammatory effect of the food group, you're getting a kind of like a depreciated value in the nutritional profile of that egg as well. And it's not like a little bit, it's not like five or 10%. It's like a huge percentage point. I mean, like 700% more beta carotene like per egg is like a huge difference. Wow. Yeah, that is huge. Yeah. So, so that's just kind of like explaining a quick, quick brief about free range organic eggs. And the same kind of goes with like free range chicken, uh, if it's rare to see free range pork in the supermarket, but it would be the same exact thing there. Also free range Turkey falls under that exact, exact same production cycle. They're all mm -hmm. fed nothing but grains because they're all kept indoors and never allowed to roam yeah. outside. So they're not fed their species specific diet. And the, the trickery in it is they're not actually like lying on the label because when they write vegetarian fed that already indicates a confined operation because if the chickens were really allowed to roam free outside they would be eating bugs and insects so you wouldn't be able to classify them as vegetarian fed that's a great point that is you know a great point. Point. you can yeah. see the trickery in these labeling tactics and they're not doing this by accident they definitely know what yeah. they're doing because like all these marketing people that work for the agricultural companies they know that the average american kind of perceives a vegetarian as a healthy person because typically that's how it's marketed in a lot of these documentaries and a lot of people don't dive deep enough to know that you know a lot of them maybe not that healthy or maybe even less healthy than an obese person for example you know right. so the average person will see that phrase and they're like oh thinking in their mind's eye like oh, okay i know vegetarians are very healthy it says the chicken is vegetarian fed that must mean the chicken is very healthy yeah right. but really like i mentioned before it just means like grain fed Predominantly, especially if it's not organic, it's most likely just fed GMO corn and soy, which has right. a tremendous amount of compounding problems because now you're not only getting that pro-inflammatory micronutrient of that omega-6, that kind of like poor omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, you're also getting a tremendous amount of synthetic biocides that might have been used to grow that genetically modified corn and soy which mm -hmm. then the hens end up eating, which then end up into the nutritional profile of the egg in this case, which you end up eating. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, and that's something we really need to consider the implications of that in both our body and the environment, you know, and I uh, remember when we had backyard chickens a while ago and, and you're so right. Like I, we came to these same conclusions. It's like, we're like, we're paying a lot of money to, to buy this feed for the, ch- this organic feed for the chickens, which it's very hard to find soy free. Uh, feed for chickens. And we have them in this house where they're pooping all the time and you're constantly cleaning it. So it really Mm -hmm. is a lot more work for the person who's taking care of the chickens. And we said, well, we, we just want, we outsource like uh, a chicken tractor, someone to make us a little chicken coop that travels all over the yard, you know, that we can move every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. And it was amazing. We didn't have to buy any more food. They they just ate off the ground all the time. And it was, it was 10 million times easier to have the chickens and much more enjoyable. Um, And so I was just, it, to me, like, I don't, I'm not really sure why I mean, I know why we're doing this. It's, it's money, you know, there's money to be made Mm -hmm. in the industry, but, um, to me, it just makes way more sense to do it. Like Joel, Joel Salatin does it, you know, with his approach and, uh, it's better for the environment as well. It's better for the animals, of course. Um, so, you know, so I guess my next question is Eugene is like, if that is the case and if it's so misleading that way, why then what is, what can we do? Like, what, how can we find, let's just specifically talk about eggs. How mm-hmm. can we find a good egg? You know, like mm-hmm. what is the labeling for that, for the egg that we really want, the, that we intend to get for our health? Yeah. And that's a really good question. And, you know, I'm not the kind of person that's just going to complain and complain about like different things. I'm going to offer like very easy solutions on this podcast as well, that anyone, even with a busy schedule can kind of like apply and do. Uh, basically, I mean, kind of finishing off the egg topic, cage free is also like even a lower standard than free range, for example. So free range, you would typically kind of get like maybe 1.2 to 1.4 square foot of space per hen. And then cage free is even less than that. Plus they don't get that small concrete patio, for example, but it's the same cage free is still, they have like mainly they're fed grains. If it's not organic, it's fed GMO, probably corn and soy, which is the cheapest. And it's also subsidized by the taxpayer. So the company doesn't really have to pay for that either. And about mm-hmm. like 80% of the cost of uh, like an animal operation is the feed to the animal. So it's it's a huge, it's a huge uh, percentage of the cost. That's why they're incentivized to use nothing but these grains. Uh, yes, so there's that heard kind that. Of background. Yeah, there's that kind of like yeah. a little bit of a political background there because uh it's kind of like farming hasn't really become a kind of capitalist system. It's more of like a fascist system because these companies are using taxpayer money to basically fund their operations. They're not funding it themselves yeah. for the most part. They are, they are, of course, like basically to dive a little bit deeper into this one, I think it's important to describe like American uh, products you find at the supermarket. When you do go to the supermarket, you see hundreds of items, right? So you think Mm -hmm. you have like a lot of variety and a lot of competition, but really uh, most of those items are produced in one way or another by like 10 to 15 different companies. Mm. So there's a tremendous amount of consolidation in the U.S. agricultural system and how most of these companies operate, especially how a lot of these kind of like chicken egg uh, operations uh, operate is basically through a vertically integrated system. And the vertically integrated system is basically, let's just kind of presume you're that uh, chicken farmer that's producing eggs. And I'm like a huge corporation like Tyson Foods, for instance. And basically I come to you and I tell you like, Allison, listen, I have all these trucks. I have the multi-million dollar slaughter facilities. I have the veterinarians. I have the logistics. I have the contracts with all these supermarkets and these fast food chains. I even have the patents on the genetically modified food, the genes with the type of chickens we use, and I even own the hatcheries too. And basically the deal is, is I'm going to bring you 50,000 chickens and you're responsible for kind of growing them to my standard. So basically if I tell you, you have to use these drugs, you have to use those drugs. If I tell you you have to feed them a non-species specific diet like grain, you're going to have to feed them that type of diet. And Of course, this kind of sounds maybe like a very restrictive deal, but it actually is very appealing to the farmer because it takes a lot of the responsibility away from the farmer. Like Mm -hmm. now the farmer doesn't have to deal with 
you know, the contracts with the supermarkets, the legal stuff, the marketing, the logistics, they could just concentrate on basically growing the chickens. So oftentimes the farmer would agree and Tyson Foods would be like, well, okay, so I'm happy that you agreed, but the problem is, is your facility is too small. So you're going to need to take out a bank loan for about like $500,000 and basically build a larger facility that can house these 50,000 chickens that we're going to bring to you like every month. But don't worry about it. We know that you're only making like, you know, 50 to $60,000 a year, maybe even less. We have a contract with the bank. And if we send you their way, they will give you the loan no matter what. You know, so the problem with that is once the farmer takes on that loan, they're kind of trapped Mm -hmm. because now they have a huge loan. $500,000 is a lot of money for anyone, for a lot of people for the most part, but especially for a farmer. Mm -hmm. And basically now they have to listen to what Tyson Foods tells them to do. Because if it doesn't work out with Tyson Foods, there's maybe like two or three other poultry producers in all of the U.S., And most likely what happens if it doesn't work out with one of them, they kind of blacklist you from the entire industry. Oh, right. So now you're kind of like forced to basically listen to, remember, like I mentioned, the bulk majority of products are produced by 10 or 15 different companies. So the problem Mm -hmm. with that system is now you have basically just a few executives telling all of Americans what they're going to eat. Because like 99.9% of Americans are just going to go to the supermarket no matter what you tell them. You know what I mean? True. Yeah, that food in the supermarket, for the most part, is produced under that vertically integrated system. And the problem with that system, another problem with that system, and I kind of hinted at it before, is the fact that those bank loans, let's say the farmer defaults on the loan. So they're in business for a while and they're paying the bank interest on their loan while in their business. But when they if they go out of business, which a lot of them do eventually end up going out of business because of super shady business practices that a lot of these vertically integrated companies use. Uh, There's a good book called The Meat Racket by uh, Christopher Leonard that goes into a lot more detail on that. But basically, if they go out of business, the bank will sell their land. Tyson Foods will most likely take over their farm and their land, which is how this consolidation happened to begin with. And then the difference of the money that the farmer can't pay back the taxpayer will pay back. They get it back from the taxpayer. Mm-hmm. So it's a Crazy. win-win. Yeah, it's a win-win for the bank and that corporation because the bank gets interest on that loan while that farmer is in business. And then when the farmer goes out of business and he can't pay it back, they'll just get the difference from the taxpayer. So what bank wouldn't agree to that? Yeah. So the logic behind you know buying factory farmed or conventional foods because it's so-called cheaper kind of goes out the window because you're paying for it anyway in other ways, exactly. right? Exactly. It, it's not that obvious on the surface. And basically, like one thing I did was I went to um, Sprouts Farmer's Market. I'm pretty sure you're mm-hmm. familiar with that chain. Yes. And basically, I standardized a 2,000 calorie diet with the same macronutrient distribution, the same amount of protein, the same amount of fat, and the same amount of carbs. So I compared a factory farmed diet from that store and then at least a supermarket level organic diet from that store. And basically, the price difference was for the factory farm 2,000 calorie a day diet, it ended up being $7.77. And for the USDA certified organic diet from that same supermarket for the 2000 calories per day, it ended up being $12.40. Wow. Yeah. That's not much at all. (laughs) No, it's about five bucks. And some people will say, well, there's a $5 difference right there. But if you consider these subsidies and these kind of like, uh, for instance, loan bailouts that happen to the taxpayer, you could easily add like another dollar or two. So -hmm. now it's only basically like a $3 difference because they're, these companies are using your money to fund their business, to sell you cheaper meat. On the surface, it looks cheaper, but really it's it's not that much cheaper. And then if you count the fact that, you know, uh, like from my observation, at least, I don't know how you are with your clients, but what I've observed is people that don't eat organic tend to eat out a lot more. Mm-hmm. So if you factor that in, the, the people that don't eat organic actually spend a lot more money on their food in total. That's true. That's a good, that's a great point. People don't really consider that. 
Yeah, there's that indirect effect. And I mean, think about it. If you're going to Starbucks every morning and buying a $5 coffee, there is your $5 difference right there. And you're getting yeah. kind of like some shitty coffee probably at that. Right. It's That's very true. I was thinking that too. Yeah. So, it, you know, I think a lot of times too, people don't want to mess with cooking and, and, and they're just tired. They're worn out. Um, you know, the grocery store is like the easiest thing, right? Um uh, but yeah, I feel very fortunate that I live in a place like Portland, Oregon, where we have access to so many amazing farms. Mm -hmm. And so we can go to a farmer's market and talk to a farmer uh, directly about their practices. Um, but it sounds like what you, we, you and I talked a little bit beforehand and you had also sent me some emails and it, and what really caught my attention was when you mentioned, um, uh, you know, how, it's kind of also a little misleading sometimes when you're even buying it from a farmer's market. Mm -hmm. and can, I would love for you to expand on that a little bit and kind of explain what you mean by that. Yeah. So basically like for eggs, there are four levels of egg production and each level has various levels of integrity. So for instance, the cheapest one that you're going to find is kind of no label on the carton. It typically doesn't say cage free. It doesn't say free range. It doesn't say pasture raised. It says nothing. That's mm -hmm. the cheapest one, and that usually means it's a caged operation, meaning they have probably like seven of these hens stuck in a single like shoebox, basically, and they live like that their entire life producing these eggs, and that's that's going to be the absolute worst quality. The second one is the cage-free, which is uh, instead of like stuck in these small little cages, they're stuck in a huge windowless warehouse. And then free range, we talked about that kind of extensively earlier in the podcast. And then the best one is pasture raised. Mm. So when it says pasture raised, but there are various levels of integrity in a pasture raised operation. So oftentimes just because you're going to a small farmer's market, that doesn't mean they're a good, competent farmer. They might be into farming, but once again, just like, you know, in any industry, just because you're self-employed doesn't mean you're good at what you do, you know? Right. Yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah. I, yeah. And I always ask them questions if I'm mm -hmm. not familiar with the farm. Um, so that sounds like what you probably recommend doing too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some questions yeah. they can ask, like for instance, if, uh, like if they go check out the farm, for example, here's, here's what I mean by levels of integrity of a pasture raised egg operation. So, it, it could be a bad operation in the sense that, like, let's say I go to a small farmer just to check them out. Yeah, and a lot of them would be open to showing you the farm if you insist on checking it out. I've never had any credible farmer say, no, I don't want to show you what I do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them these days have YouTube content, too, so you can kind of see it on there. Mm -hmm. But let's say you go to them and they have um, chickens that run around outside on an acre of land. Let's say they have like 300 chickens on this acre of land and they're all egg laying hens because that's what we're talking about today but they don't rotate them onto fresh pasture daily. This could be because of a myriad of reasons. Maybe they just don't have more land. Maybe they just don't have the labor, or maybe they just don't want to because it does require like a lot, uh, a decent amount more work of having to basically every morning kind of move these hens to a different fresh pasture. So you kind of run into a little bit of the same problem you ran into in the free range operation we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So these hens, in this case, they are outside 24 seven, which is great. That's a good step in the right direction. That indicates great husbandry practices. So the hens aren't super stressed out. And there's an old Native American saying, whether you believe it or not, is basically like if you eat the flesh of miserable animals, you kind of inherit the misery of that animal. Mm. So if you I kind kinda, of more spiritual, I, I'd like to believe that. <laughs> yeah, if you're more spiritual, mm. you can kind of side with that. And that's a plus side of that operation. But one of the negatives I would see of that operation is I would look around and I'm like, well, okay, you're not taking your hens on onto fresh pasture daily. You're not taking your hens to the food. So you have to bring the food to the hens. So in this case, remember we talked about that the cost to the farmer is about like 70 to 80 percent of the total cost of the operation. That's how much the feed kind of is composed of. The food takes up the majority of the operational costs. And if you don't know the right questions to ask, they could just be feeding these hens genetically modified corn and soy. Right. So yeah, you that, ask yeah. them, you know, are you feeding GMO grains? And some of them will say, no, I don't feed GMO grains. Okay, but are your grains organic? They'll go, some of them 
some of them don't don't say it's in fact like a lot of these pasteurized operations unfortunately don't use organic grains i've come to i've come to find oh, a lot wow. of them do but like maybe yeah. 20 or 30 percent of them don't and that could be the cost factor because it's a little more you know what so, i mean so yeah. in your research and in your what you found eugene is or maybe also your opinion what is are there that, that many farms doing that out there that are letting the chickens roam freely uh, and without feeding them grains? Or is that kind of, um, or do you feel like that's getting, or do you feel like there's more and more farms that are doing that? Or is there less and less kind of, what, what do you see the trend right now? Well, honestly, unless you have like a very rich soil, like there's like a lot of, like a good indication of very healthy soil is if you see earthworms in the mm. soil that that mm. basically means there's a very abundant like soil food web which is an indication that that soil has a tremendous amount of food and nutrients that's going to be able to support the nutritional requirements of that hen but the problem with commercial operations even small farms is like that would only work if you had like 10 chickens you know what i mean yeah like maybe yeah. if you're living semi off grid like in your example like you mentioned you had your own chickens okay that might work maybe if you had like really rich soil but in most cases you still will have to supplement with some type of grains so um it, the the problem is the problem becomes is when they don't have that balance in the diet and all you use is grains so for example in the pre in the like two minutes earlier i mentioned that farmer had 300 chickens mm -hmm. so like i mentioned chickens eat all day so they're going to run out, out of those worms and those insects very quickly on that acre acre piece of land as you know you've had the chickens they kind of get up and they just like eat all day and then yeah. they go to sleep so imagine 300 of those <laughs> um so in that case you'll run out of all those insects and you'll have to rely more and more on grains but one thing you could ask and some and i see this becoming more of a popular trend is do you in your feed do you is, is your feed corn and soy free mm. Yeah. Like for instance, I volunteered at a place called Happy Dash Hens. Uh, their website is happy-hens.com, and they're a certif USDA certified organic corn and soy free egg laying operation. And their chickens have 200 square feet per hen, where the average chicken in a free range operation has like 1.2. Mm. To give you an example, they wow. move their um, they move their hens onto fresh pasture daily. And their feed is certified organic. They use like chickpeas, um, alfalfa, and some other stuff. I forgot exactly what the ratio was, but if you message them, if you email them, they'll give it to you, no problem. Uh, but they're a corn and soy free operation. So there are, I think, um, primalpastures.com sells corn and soy free chicken meat. So like broiler chickens, if you are if you need like a corn and, and, and they are a pasture raised operation as well. Another cool mm -hmm. website a person can check out is um, eatwild.com. They can go to the top left. There's a tab that's like find local meats, eggs, and dairy. They can click on that. It'll have a map of the U.S. And then mm -hmm. they can click on their state and it'll show you all the local farms in your area. And all those farms will deliver to your house in a two-day period. Oh, that's amazing. So there's that convenience factor as well that you talked about earlier. Like, now they just deliver to you. It's very, very common for all these companies to do that. And don't worry about it being, uh, if it's meats, for instance, don't worry about it being flash frozen. In fact, if it's flash frozen, it's probably fresher. Yeah. You know I, what I, I mean? Than kind of the I meat just that had a, on the counter at the store. Yeah, absolutely. We I just had a guest on who uh, is a, is in the food industry. She's a food, she has a company called Brazi Bites and it's a Brazilian cheese bread company. And she was talking about actually freezing food is a way to just preserve it better naturally instead of adding all the chemicals. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about it like that. I said, oh yeah, that makes total sense. So the same can be true for meat. Um, and of course you probably do want it frozen if it's being mm -hmm. shipped to you, of course. But yeah. um, I just go to the store. When I go to the store and buy eggs, I always just look for soy-free organic eggs. Is that kind of what you would consider the top egg uh, to get or or the highest quality? Um, 
they, I do see I do see the soy free eggs. The well, some things to look forward to, I guess, at the supermarket. If you're looking at the label, I would like to see pasture raised written on there for sure. Okay. Although once again, there like I mentioned, there are various levels of integrity of pasture raised. Um, I would also like to see they should have a stamp on there that says like 100 square foot per hen minimum. That's like okay. a good, good general standard. Like the okay. farm I worked at was like minimum of like 230. So mm. there are obviously like even higher levels of integrity. Uh, but the one you're going to see the most at the supermarket, if you do see higher levels of integrity, is that 100 square foot. Once again, I like to see that because it means like less crowding. And when it means less crowding, the chickens have more opportunity to eat those bugs and insects and other minerals in the ground and not be so heavily reliant on just grains. So you have, that better, you have that better balance between the omega-3 and the omega-6. And then you also have all those other, like I mentioned, the Joel Salatin and those other like legit pasture-raised farms where they compared their eggs to the factory farm ones. They had like 700% more beta carotene, like 300% more omega-3. Uh, it's like it's the difference is pretty crazy. So because a lot of times people are like, ah, oh, it's just like such a small difference. No, it's like really massive, especially yeah. in produce. Like if you compare one carrot that's like from a legit like biodynamic operation that's freshly picked and you eat it within 24 hours, that could have the nutritional profile of like 20 in-store organic carrots. Wow. Yeah. And I think it. it even more importantly, vitamin A too, which is so important. And it's, yeah. it's a big factor in, um, thyroid health as well. Um, I'm trying to, um, no, go ahead and keep talking. I was, you know what? I was trying to find that one study to give you the numbers exactly, but yeah, uh, go for it. Yeah. About vitamin A as well. And I think it was like 200% higher than the factory farmed ones, but wow. That's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. Well, um, yeah. Okay. So this is, this is awesome. It, I would love to, I feel like you've, we've kind of gone as very deep into finding the perfect egg. That's amazing. I love that. And it sounds like to me that you, um, you know, you, you really gave everybody some great advice about how to find the right kind of egg and, and to read the label and, and to find the deeper meaning of what those terms mean. Because I think, again, like I said earlier, a lot of these uh, labels have been slapped on and, and everybody's like, what does that mean now? You know, this is a new thing. But of course, they try mm -hmm. to make it sound healthy and like like the vegetarian fed thing, like that's not necessarily healthy. Actually, that's not ideal. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Thank you for sharing uh, the happyhens.com and the Primal Pastures, those two companies. Is there any other, are there any other companies that you recommend if you're going to a store to buy a, mm -hmm. a product? Or I also also recommend like just going to your, to the farmer's market at least once a week and just talking to the farmers, like we said, finding out, you know, the farms that have the, that uh, have the practices or do the practices, uh, the good practices of the high quality food and um, letting their, their animals roam. Once you kind of identify those, it's not a lot of work then to find them again. You just find them every week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they do want to stick to the supermarket, a cool website is cornucopia.org. Cor okay, great. Right. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that website actually yeah. lists, uh, I think if you go to cornucopia.org, it's been a while since I've been on there, there's a tab on the top right called scorecard. You click on that, then you click on the eggs category, and that'll basically give you a breakdown of pretty much every single egg company you're going to find at the supermarket, and it'll tell you like how factory farm that brand is. Oh, great. Yeah, that's the best well resource, I think, if you're really dead set on just sticking to the supermarket. Yeah, because I think I think a lot of people are going to still do that. And and most people that I work with, um, you know, they still go to the store and, and we we go to a mix of the store and the farmer's market just because we have two teenage boys and they eat a lot. So mm -hmm. we're constantly going to the to pick up food all the time. Um, but uh but I would like to like touch upon grass fed beef real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, we, I just got back from Hawaii and it was amazing. Like every, they had grass fed, fed beef everywhere, hundred percent, because mm -hmm. of course it's easier there instead of shipping it over. They just have all the cows there eating grass, which is of course the, the most, um, convenient way to raise the cattle there. But, um, I know that 
you have talked about it being a little bit different. Uh, if it doesn't say 100% grass-fed beef, it's grass-finished most likely. And you were saying that that changes the beef uh, nutritionally, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, grass-fed, it's another kind of like, there's a lot of trickery that goes on in, in that label as well. Uh, so, I mean, in this conversation, there are a lot of animals that are grass-fed, but in this conversation, we're talking about cattle. I guess it's important to realize that all beef is grass-fed. Mm-hmm. Like, just because you see that grass-fed label on there doesn't really mean or say any anything different because you can't feed grains to cattle their entire life and keep them alive. So, like, for example, and let's say, like, there's a 18-month production cycle from start to finish. So a typical cattle operation, the, the cow will spend about like 90% of its life on pasture eating grass, like all cattle. And then for the most part, all of them, like 98 plus percent are sent to a feedlot and finished with grain. And obviously the problems occur here too, because the cow's natural species specific diet is kind of like a herbivore. They're supposed to be eating grass and other forage their entire life. When you feed them grains, even for that short period of time, it shoots the omega-6 way up. Once again, you're you're eating this food, you're thinking it's kind of giving you some health benefits, but it's it's really high in omega-6. The the natural ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 is off on that food group. And all it's doing is just going to be adding to inflammation in your body. And then when you kind of look at the total picture of like the typical individual these days, they're overworked. There's a lot of inflammation there. Most people are going to jobs and working with bosses they don't like. There's going to be a lot of inflammation from that because mental stress causes a lot of inflammation as well. Then they're sitting in traffic. That's going to cause a lot of inflammation. They're getting exposed to pollutants, EMFs. That's going to cause, and you can kind of see how it's all adding up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, um, People will say, oh, but my beef is grass-fed and grass-finished. I'm like, okay, well, as a rancher, I work on a cattle operation, like legit 100% cattle operation, maybe like 10 minutes from my house, actually. And um, I could tell you in the industry, it's it's very common to feed the cattle grass for, let's say, eight months, put them on grains for two or three months, finish them on grass for a week, and then label it grass-fed and grass-finished. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's like super, super common. Also, like if it says 100 grass, 100 percent grass fed. okay, I could just finish my cattle in a a feedlot with hay and grass pellets and I could still claim it's 100 percent grass fed. Really? And you can see like if a person doesn't dive deep into the subject, they will be buying that product their entire life and not even look, think twice about it. Yeah. And they're wondering like, man, I'm eating healthy, but I feel like. I have all these inflammation symptoms like joint pain. I mean, the symptoms are a a myriad of symptoms, but just some could be like joint pain, gut issues. I I don't seem to heal or recover from workouts well, mental depression. Uh, The list goes on and on. Yeah. So that's the implications of not really checking out your food and knowing uh, the practices of the farmers that are, that are producing it. Um, yeah, and, and it builds up. Actual, but from what- a compounding problem is the U.S. actually gets like 90% of its grass-fed beef from overseas. It's not even oh. produced in the U.S. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, because yeah. that's a lot of, I don't, I didn't know that until I heard you talk about it. And I would love to, to actually bring that up because I don't think a lot of people know a lot of the food comes from other countries and the practices that they have going on in those countries are not the standards that we hold here. Well, here, here's where some more trickery comes in. So they don't know because these products have a stamp on there that says product of the USA. Now, what does that mean legally? Legally, I could import carcasses from Mexico, process them in California into packages and label it product of the USA. Hmm. That's totally 100% legal and happens like all the time. So when you see product of the USA, that most likely means it's like grown overseas. And just packaged and processed in the USA. Like what you want to see is grown and harvested in the USA. Not even just grown in the USA, because sometimes they grow them here, process them in a different place, then ship them back over here, and then sell them here. Oh, wow. 
So you can see there's so much like layers of trickery. It's like a, if a person is even health conscious, does want to make the right choices, it's like super hard these days. I mean, honestly, like my journey started with, like I mentioned, is just trying to find healthy eggs. And it's like three years in and I'm still learning all these like tricks, tricks and everything that, uh, that, you know? So you, you kind of created, you started, you wrote this book based on like your own personal journey. You were just curious and you wanted to learn for yourself. It sounds like, um, you know, go a little deeper and, and learn about why, you know, as these have changed, like what all this means, like it's, it is super confusing as we talk about this. It's like, you could probably talk about this for five hours. It, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that they make it so much more complicated. Like I, I'm not really sure why you would, per, you know, grow something somewhere, process it overseas and bring it back. To me, that just doesn't, it's, just it's, cheaper. Just it's the labor when it comes to me. Even like that, is it cheaper really to do that? That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I haven't looked into honestly, like the hardcore economics, maybe a person you could ask is a, is a woman named Carrie Balcom. I, uh -huh. I actually interviewed her, uh, as well. And she's, I think the director of, um, American grass fed association. And she's really into all the politics of, she knows the inside and outside of all this, like political stuff of the grass fed label. And um, so I didn't look into like the hardcore economics behind, you know, like why that's done. But I presume it's just cheaper because of labor costs and also regulatory costs are probably less in like other countries. Like a lot of these countries, yeah. they don't even have like the resources to combat like serious crime in their countries. Moreover, go after a farmer for like not feeding them grass 100%, 100% right. of the time, you know. If you ever yeah. go to a third world country, you'll know like exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. I have, you, did you say if you've ever lived in a third world world country? Is that what you said? Or traveled. Like you'll see. Or traveled. Like, yeah. The, the law and regulation just isn't there. You know, it's kind of foolish yeah. to presume there's some inspector that's going out there and really making sure it's a legit operation. Yeah. That's not a top priority there for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so I would actually, now, now that we're talking about grass fed beef, I would actually like to, um, step into the land of uh, the impossible burger and the beyond burger. Mm -hmm. Like what is going on here? You know, so um, what I've noticed a lot is all of a sudden there's this rage of this. Uh, and of course you see it in fast food um, restaurants. They're, they're selling, like, I think I heard it, it. They were selling something like the beyond burger impossible burger at Dunkin Donuts or something like that. I was like, what? Oh, that's a good place to sell it actually. Like junk. <laughs> Exactly. Very, very so, fitting. but people think it's, they associate it with being a health food mm -hmm. and, and, and something like that is almost, um, just as nutritious as grass fed beef or something like that. And I'm like, no, 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 this is not, there's no comparison here. So maybe we can get into that and talk about that a bit because I don't really think that, um, people understand the implications of, of, their what that means for their health when we mm -hmm. when we embrace a product like that or the environment too because it it, ha it takes a toll on the environment because now we're having to grow you know I don't know it's probably GMO um, ingredients in it but mm -hmm. um, actually the Impossible Burger yeah it has wheat protein it does have coconut oil in it but potato protein natural flavors. Uh, soy yeast extract, soy protein isolate, all these gums, anthem gum, and it has, you know, some B vitamins in there too. But um, yeah, I mean, there's not much, you just can't compare that in my opinion to a grass fed burger, you know, or a hundred percent grass fed burger. Um, yep. So yeah, can we get can you like share your opinion on that and, and kind of what you know about it? And, and we can talk about that some. Yeah. And I, I'll break it down in like various layers because in order to get like a very thorough answer, mm -hmm. uh, I would have to explain it in, in many vantage points. Um, okay. So one, one first and foremost, like a lot of these companies are able to get away with these claims because the average American is so far detached from the farming lifestyle. Like they literally don't know how anything is made, how any other food is made. Uh, so because of that, they're able to kind of like use all these claims like we've talked about just now, and then also kind of claim like this is just as healthy as this, and no one kind of questions it. 
another another thing to consider is if you look at the world if i kind of compare the world to an apple right and i shave off about 75 percent of the surface area of that apple that's pretty much the ocean the surface area of the ocean then i shave up about shave off about 15 more percent of that apple that land is basically unfarmable like you can't grow anything on that land because it's either too cold or too dry or whatever so you're basically left with about like 10 percent of the earth's land mass that could be farmable and most metropolitan areas are actually constructed on farmable land so you're really left with about like five percent of the total land mass of the planet that's able to be farmed for food so keep that into consideration. It's a very small amount of land that's actually able to be farmed for food and able to produce food from the soil. Another problem is that, especially for the vegetarians that rely on corn, soy, beans, lentils, wheat, whatever, grains, all those, all those food groups come from single crop farming systems or what's referred to as monocropping. Mm -hmm. that's actually what's destroying the planet. Monocropping is what's destroying the, uh, the planet. Lack of biodiversity, which is kind of like taxing the soil a tremendous amount, is what's destroying the planet. A lot of, a lot of vegetarians, when I talk to them, they're like, oh, I'm, I can't believe all these fires are happening in the Amazon. They're going to just build huge cattle operations. No, all those fires are happening, so they make room for corn and soy operations. Mm -hmm. and other commodities like grains of various sorts, stuff that they're eating. And some of them will argue like, ah, oh, no, they're fed to the cows. So no, first of all, most of them aren't fed to the cows. Maybe like 60 or 70% actually go to ethanol production. Then like 20% go to factory farms, which I'm not a big fan of either. I also agree factory farms should go. Mm -hmm. But if you feed an animal a species-specific diet, so in this case a cattle, all they would be eating is grass. You don't need to grow grass. You just need to put them on land where there's grass and they'll eat yeah. the grass. So you don't need to have all these plantations to create food for an animal that's not even supposed to be eating that food. Right. So yes, they have a point. But it, with a lot of vegetarian debates, it's not a debate about the ethics. Because a lot of times they say like, oh, it's destroying the environment. It's more of a debate about the farming practice. And the food they're eating is what's destroying the planet. These monocrop, single crop farming operations are destroying the planet because it's important to consider like when you look at fertile soil there's a tremendous amount of life in that soil it took the earth basically the earth has been around for 4.5 billion years of extremely complicated evolution and it took that long to form the unique composition of the soil to be able to give rise to the type of crops we see today it didn't happen just overnight so a lot of times what you don't see in the soil is there's like a tremendous amount of life there. Like I like to compare it to, do you remember this old movie called like Escape from L.A.? Vaguely, yeah. <laughs> or you remember like, I guess, Saving Private Ryan, that beach landing on Normandy? Mm -hmm. Like basically like on that scene, it's that's what's happening in that underground soil food web. Like there's mm -hmm. like a tremendous amount of, uh, for, for example, the sun hits the plant. Through photosynthesis, the plant exerts sugar from its roots that basically feed the bacteria, the fungi, which there are like millions of those species, like around the root system, the stratosphere of the root system. That feeds the nematodes, the protozoa, which feed the insects, which feed the worms, and then the worms feed the birds or like the other animals, and those animals feed other animals. So you can kind of see by like, and my point is these monocropping systems, they deplete that diverse ecosystem. Yes. Like when you grow like a single crop on a piece of land over and over and over again, that single crop requires a certain composition of that foil, uh, soil food web to provide it the nutrients it needs to grow. And when you're constantly depleting that soil of that one nutrient, it becomes, there's an imbalance. When there's an imbalance, the plant becomes weak and sick as well. And when plants are sick, what does nature do to get rid of these sick plants? They send in pests. Pests are nature's way of getting rid of sick plants. Hmm. 
So then the farmer has to use, let's say in this case, it's an organic farmer. The organic farmer has to use an industrial, let's say in this case, it's an industrial organic farmer. He has to use a tremendous amount of organic biocides, which damage that soil food web even more. So next planting season, they have even a worse problem of that same exact problem. And they have to do that again with more chemicals and then more chemicals and then more chemicals. And every time they do that, the nutritional profile of the crop is lower and lower and lower. So on top of the single crop monocrop farming system, just destroying the soil and turning it into dirt, basically, the crops that these vegetarians are eating all come from these single crop systems that are nutritionally inferior because there is no biodiversity in that system. Mm -hmm. So it makes it because of the industrial agricultural system, which supplies the resources for companies like Impossible Burger, even if a person wants to transition out of animal products, it's very hard for them to be healthy because they rely on single crop farming systems and they're nutritionally inferior. And on top of that, most of these crops, like especially the vegetables and fruits you see at the supermarket are picked before they ripen. And during that ripening phase is when that fruit or the vegetable gets most of its nutrients. So when you combine the fact that the fruit and the vegetable didn't have that much nutrition to begin with, and then it's picked before it's ripened, and then it sits at the grocery store. Well, first of all, it takes like a week or two to get to the grocery store, and then it sits at the grocery store for like a couple more days, then it sits in your refrigerator for a couple more days. Every day that goes by, the nutritional profile of the food group gets worse and worse and worse. And remember, there's not that much of it to begin with. And then you eat it and you think you're eating healthy food, but you're just eating empty calories. In fact, like a lot of people don't know, but the organic produce you find at Walmart is actually more nutritionally dense than the organic produce you find at Whole Foods. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I did and not the know that. For that is because Whole Foods logistics system is just slower. So for example, like in Walmart, it'll take like from farm to shelf at the store, it'll take like three to five days, for example, but a Whole Foods will take like maybe like eight to 10 days. Hmm. I, yeah, I had, that makes sense. That actually makes a lot of sense, but you would never think that Walmart had higher quality food than Whole Foods. We just don't associate that, right? Yeah, and there's a cool um, company called Teak Origin they're the ones mm -hmm. that kind of went around and testing all this food, I think, around the Massachusetts area, if I'm not mistaken. So people can kind of look into their work. They're doing some pretty, pretty cool work. That's great. I will definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll put the know. link on the in the show notes. Um, well, that's awesome. Thank you. And and I think also as well as the having, like you mentioned, having implications for the environment, you know, it's a trendy thing right now. So not even it's not even affecting just vegetarians or vegans, it's also affecting just people wanting to try it, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, this is cool. This is an alternative. Let's try it. And we're not really considering, um, you know, what it's going to do to our body and, and what we're supporting. And, and so I'm so glad we talked about that today and you brought to light, um, some things about that industry that, um, that we need to really think about and consider and, and not just, you know, run right toward it and not, not ask any questions or think, huh, you know, maybe this, maybe this isn't really good, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because again, like you said, having one source for our, our food, and we're just getting our food from one thing, one source, that's not good. That's not good, you know, for anybody, <laughs> except for the people who are making money off of it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I still, I think that we need the freedom to be able to, to choose the food. And, and for some people, they're never maybe going to be there. They're just going to always want, um, they're not going to want to mess with that part of it. And they want people to tell them what to eat or to, for it to be ready so they can keep going on for the, to, with their lives. You know, they just want something that's easy and they don't have to think about maybe, but, um, but you know, when you get older and you're doing that, it really catches up with you. Um. And then we have all these issues um, health wise that that come up as well. So in my opinion, it's not worth it. It's really worth it to take responsibility for yourself and look into these things. And Eugene, I really appreciate you putting together this book 
mm-hmm. for people as a, just an incredible resource for them to not feel overwhelmed, but just to have that. Um, even if you, I would, I would even suggest get Eugene's book and take it to the grocery store with you because um, if you're going to the grocery store or, you know, just go to your, go to your local uh, farmer's market and, and read up and, and know the, what questions you need to ask too. Right. Yep. Yeah. And it also yeah. comes with a comprehensive video series that they have access to as well. So I yeah. basically break down all the food labels, exactly how they look. I show them on the video, exactly how that label looks and what it means. And, uh, basically like, the thing you don't want to be buying if you do stick at the supermarket and the exact food group you do want to be buying uh, if you do stick at the supermarket. So, Perfect. Well, thank you, G- Eugene. I mm-hmm. really had the best time. I'm so glad that you came on and, and shared all this really, really valuable information for people. I appreciate it so much. Cool. Thanks, Allison. Check out Eugene's book, Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide on Amazon. I'll leave a link as well in the show notes so you can get right to it. It is a great resource and one of the best investments you'll probably ever make in your health. So check it out. You can also find Eugene at trufkinathletics.com. One more thing you can check out, something that Eugene shared with me after the show was recorded, uh, was uh, a site that you can use to um, to basically scan your produce on demand, and it'll provide you with the exact nutrient profile of that specific crop, which is pretty cool. Um, and so it may be better than depending on a label sometimes too, or you could use both and and figure that out that way. But uh, I will provide the link for that on the show notes here. And uh, I believe it's called, the website is called Bio Nutrient Food Association. And um, yeah, and check it out and download that app and, and see how it goes. Thank you all for listening. And I can't wait to talk to you all again soon. Bye-bye.